There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. And here is a massive TBR that's going to cover up to three readathons for the rest of the year. The first one is Shorty September, which is a month long readathon organized by Bert and Shani of PA Storytime and Heather of Soggy Expat Book Nerd. And then I'm not going to get through this stack of books in one month. Obviously not. Wait till you see how tall it is. And so I was quite relieved to hear that, uh, and happy for all kinds of reasons, but relieved in particular that Rick McDonnell is back on Booktube and he's planning to resuscitate novellas in November. So whatever I don't get read, I mean, I'll probably read them through October too, let's be honest, but there'll be plenty to keep me busy and I'm not going to make a separate novellas in November TBR video because this is it, people. And then I'm hoping that Bob the Bookerer will bring back in December for another year. He launched that last year, and that was not short books, but books from independent presses. And so uh, I would say 80 to 90 percent of these will also fit for that. So here's my TBR for the rest of the year, people. I think I'll probably have a Victoria one and maybe one or two others as well, but this is a mammoth TBR. And so here's what I'm going to do. There are a bunch of books here, probably most of the ones at the beginning, that are also, I'm, ha I'm hauling them. You haven't seen them. So I'm going to read the, the opening sentence or the opening paragraph if it has a standalone vitality. But any of the ones, and that's probably 60%, 70% of them, that I've shown on my channel before, I'm just going to hold it up and give you a sentence or two about it. Okay? As well as a few library books that I'll treat as if I'm hauling them. Okay, Sean, you've got explained all the rules. Let's get to it. I don't remember the specifics of what tweet I saw, but here is a novel from an indie press, Convingo Publishing. I saw a tweet about it, I ordered it, came in the mail, and it's actually signed by the author. It is called The Unheard by Anne Worthington. She lives in the north of England. It's her debut novel. It's published in 2023. It seems to be a trauma and memory. I'm not sure if the protagonist is challenged with memory loss but there's something going on that he doesn't recognize the people around him and I have no idea how old he is or anything more than that because I don't want to know any more than that before I dive in. There are at least two characters and the title chapters are the characters names. So the first chapter is Tom and this is 1999. If I sit here nothing can happen. I can't spend money I don't have. I'm safe here. Ghosts came one day and pulled at my shoes, and when they finished having their fun with me, they flung me to the ground. She would not believe me. She said I tripped on my shoes. But I tell her, ghosts have gathered around this place, and that bodes ill. But she won't have that either. I'm having a pseudo-buddy read with Alex, who used to have a booktube channel. I don't remember what it was called, because it's been a long time since it existed. A frequent guest on my bite-sized book chats and a patron of mine on Patreon... We're going to buddy read this from the Booker Long List. Pearl by Sean Hughes. We were already planning to read it approximately in September. 220 pages, so it's at least 20 pages longer than anything else on my TBR. You've heard more than enough about this book on other videos on other channels, so I'm just going to wave it at you. It's one of the few on the long list that sound like they might be Sean books. So here is another one I am bought impulsively, and I think it was a somebody's tweet, or I don't remember. And a beautiful little novella. If it, uh, I can't even remember if it's fiction. I think it is. Might be autofiction, but look at this cover. Cherry by Joanne Beard. 90-page novella, or whatever it is. Good lord, there's about six pages of blurbs for it. Or for her. Serpent's Tales, the publisher, and 2021. It is not that as new as I thought. Whether this is a true story or not, it is about a woman dying of cancer. Her name is Cherry. It's dedicated to Cherry Tremble, 1950 to 1997. So again, I don't know if it's a fictionalized account or what it is, but let's listen to the opening paragraph. They came slowly down the street, two boys on bicycles, riding side by side to the glare of a summer afternoon. She's on the curb, and the sun is so bright and hot, it feels like her hair is on fire. 
If she glances down, she can just see the rubber toes of her sneakers and the skirt of her sundress, the color of root beer. The boys are playing tug-of-war, leaning away from each other, front wheels wobbling, each grasping one end of a long black snake. They have pale matching hair that stands up like the bristles of a brush, and their mouths are open in silent, gleeful shouts. The snake is dusty and limp, but as they sweep past, she sees its eye, wide awake, and the sudden flat ribbon of tongue, scarlet against the boy's white wrist. I'm assuming that's a toy snake and not a real snake, but anyway, that's beautiful. Beautiful prose. My uh, bookish Twitter friend, James, who's been on my channel umpteen times, the Australian guy from Adelaide, he put out a mischievous tweet uh, about this book and said, I'm only the one of three people that have bought a copy of this. You should buy one too. And I promptly bought it. From a Danish novelist, Karen Michael... Michael... Oh, let's see. Charlie, it's an Oh, God. Charlie, it's an I can't even understand that. Um, Karen Michaelis. Karen Michaelis. Karen Michaelis. I can do that. And here it is. It's called The Dangerous Age. That's quite a striking cover. Oh, good lord. James did the typeset. I didn't know he did typesetting. My goodness. Whiskey Priest is the name of the publisher. The printer is Lulu something. So that's where I got it. 128 pages. Karen Michaelis, 1872 to 1950. Prolific Danish novelist, mostly children's stuff, children's novels. However, in the early 20th century, she was infamous for what were seen as explicit, alarming books about the nature and inner lives of women, and this is one of the best known of these, The Dangerous Age. Doesn't that sound fascinating? So this was originally published in 1910 in Danish, and then it was anonymously translated in 1911, and that's the translation we have. So we don't have any information on the translator. At least the first chapter is a letter. It looks like it's an epistolary novel. And I don't think that the first short paragraph or even the first two paragraphs have a standalone vitality. So let's just leave it at that. But I'm certainly going to give this a try. Here is an Algerian novella. I think this is actually a 2021 English translation. It is called Tomorrow They Won't Dare to Murder Us by Joseph Andrus. It's translated from the French by Simon Lesserre. And it's set in Algiers in 1956. And that's about the, the revolution. And I can't remember what I've heard about it, except that whatever it was I heard about it was exemplary. I learned something new about my library. In my most recent vlog, I noticed this on the new release shelf. These Particular Women by Kat Meads. And because it had the new sticker, I figured I could only sign it out for a three-week loan with no possibility of renewal. But it was still there when I went back a month later, and so I brought it up to the counter and I said, Um, do you know, can you tell me when this will no longer be new and I can borrow it and renew it like a normal book? And she said, oh, with just a new sticker, you can renew it up to three times, no problem. It's the ones that have the hot sticker, hot read sticker or whatever. So I signed it out and thought, okay, this will be a read for... Shorty September. This is a collection of essays about women writers of the 20th century. And they seem like kind of whimsical but yet scholarly essays like Virginia Woolf. Um, did she take her walking stick into the river? Was revenge Agatha Christie's motive when she disappeared for those few weeks? Did Mary McCarthy believe her own hype? Like they just sound really fun. Um, and I'd never heard of Cat Meads. I, I do have to say that's the ugliest cover. So I was thought I'd buy the Kindle, because this is not a book whose cover does a, a thing for me, but the content sounds pretty darned interesting. So who is Cat Meads? She's written a ton of books, prose and poetry. The publisher is Sagging Meniscus. Cat Meads is from North Carolina, has written six novels. She's a North Carolina native living in California, and that's all I need to know about her. These essays sound very intriguing. Here's another library book. This is a lesbian novel, very short. Dot and Ralphie by Amy Hoffman. This was one I just found a few weeks ago, browsing the shelves, and I'm looking at the spines now. Have I heard of this author? No. Is it short? Yes. Looked at it further, saw that it was a lesbian story, uh, maybe a romance, but certainly a, about a lesbian couple who were in their late 60s. Hello! I can't think of any premise that is more of a Sean premise than this. Dot and Ralphie. So Amy Hoffman has written one other novel and, a, and some memoirs. 
doesn't say where she lives, and modern authors don't seem to want to divulge that information, or maybe it's just passe to even mention it. <laughs> American, anyway. This is published by the University of Wisconsin Press. Here is the opening paragraph of Chapter 1. There's Ralphie. She's stuck on the living room couch, wearing her safety orange Boston Department of Public Works hoodie and a huge pair of pink satin boxers decorated with red hearts, a joke gift from Dot last Valentine's. But they're easier to pull on over her knee brace than anything else in her dresser, and she likes the feeling of the slick material against her bare butt. I'm going to stop after that opening sentence, because that's enough. Oh my god! <laughs> Sounds wonderful! It's kind of like a lesbian Barbara Pym sensibility. <laughs> This is a novella that Lindy sold me on when I was when I visited her earlier in the summer or late in the spring, and it's by an Edmonton, Alberta, Canada novelist, Wendy McGrath, who I'd never heard of, Santa Rosa. This is the first of, I believe, a trilogy. The young narrator is trying to make sense of dis disillusion of her parents' marriage. Subtle poetic prose, published 2011. I believe the most recent, the final book in the series, or of the trilogy, just came out in the last year. Looks almost like it's poetry on the page. Here's the opening paragraph of the prologue. When Christine discovered she was pregnant, she began to crave the taste of dirt. Her sense of smell, of taste, of touch, was keener than it had ever been. In malls, she smelled cigarette smoke when she couldn't even see a cigarette. Positive, she tasted vinegar and chicken soup. She was able to detect the slightest variation in the taste of water. She smelled dust. Tea stains in the sink. I'll do one more short paragraph. In a book of days, she kept track of what she ate, how many glasses of milk she drank, whether or not she had taken a vitamin pill. All of these details became infinitely important. Each day, a remembrance. Well, I think the prose, or the poetry, is quite lovely. I think m the rest of them I have talked about more than once in TBRs and I'd never got to them or book haul videos over the past several years or the last year or whatever so these you're going to get much shorter treatment. Here is the most recent novel, it's a novella really, from Carrie Fagan, the author of one of my most favorite novellas, The Student. This one's called The Animals. And Lindy loved it and I think one other booktuber friend of mine did, I can't remember, but the protagonist makes miniature, miniature scale models displayed in the local quaint tourist village where he lives. And he's got all kinds of family problems, because otherwise his, his job sounds w lovely, but he's got lots of it problems in his life. And um, I hope there aren't animals that talk in the book. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that even if there are, that Carrie Fagan can pull it off. Carrie Fagan is a Jewish-Canadian writer, and he lives in Canada somewhere... Toronto, his hometown. He's lived in Toronto his whole life. This came out from Book Hug Press in 2022. One of the very first bite-sized book chats I ever did was about this novella, Address Unknown by Catherine Cressman Taylor. I will put a link to that chat in the show notes. In 1932, it's a series of letters between a Jewish art dealer in San Francisco and his old friend and former business partner who has returned to Germany just as Hitler's coming to power. And apparently it's incredibly powerful. I hate bind-ups with a passion, but I'm going to hold my nose and give this a try because I'm interested in sampling something by the writer. So two novellas in one volume. Blue Venom and Forbidden Incense. And the author is Sied Shamsul Haq, translated by Sagata Ghosh. This is Bangladeshi fiction. So I believe it would, would have been translated from the Bengali. But I will find out more about that when I start to read it. The author, Syed Shamsul Haq, is an award-winning Bangladeshi poet and writer. Here is the most recent short story collection from Sharon Butala, one of Canada's best writers, and lived most of her life in Saskatchewan, but now lives in Calgary. She was on my channel uh, quite recently. Season of Fury and Wonder, and the concept of these is really interesting. Each story features a different elderly female protagonist, and each story is in dialogue with a canonical short story not written by Sharon Butella. Those short stories that are being dialogued with <laughs> um, are not included in the thing, so I may, you know, read, read them as a pairing as I go along, but this sounds wonderful. Season of Fury and Wonder, and this was published in 2018. 
Years ago, I read Rose Tremaine's novel, The Gustav Sonata, and I loved it. And I started collecting more of her stuff, and I've got three or four here, and I've never read any of them. Here is what I'm quite sure is a collection of short stories called Evangelista's Fan, published in 1994. I think I might have read one of these stories to Lindy during the concussion project, but I can't remember now. An Island by Karen Jennings. It was on the Booker long list three years ago. I got it because I was committed to reading the long list. I failed miserably at reading the long list, but I still have it and I still want to try it. If you watched my most recent University Library book haul, and I've got another one almost ready to post in the week or two, so the one I posted maybe in July, one of the books I played with in that vlog was this gay novel, Timothy Ireland's Who Lies Inside. I really hate the cover illustration. It's just, oh, that's just terrible. Um, it, it's so off-putting, it makes me want not to read the book. But I read the first ten pages and loved them, so... This is a British novel. He was born in Kent in 1959, and this is published by the Gay Men's Press, the sadly missed Gay Men's Press, in 1984. Uh, the title of this French novella is going to defeat me, so I'm just going to cheat by playing it to you. Thérèse Desquereau. Thérèse Desquereau. Thérèse Desquereau. Desquereau. All right, that's a, that's a mouthful. Thérèse yeah. Desquereau. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um. Thérèse okay. Desquereau. Stop. So that's the title of the novella, and the author is Francois Mauriac. And it was made into a movie. I've had it on my shelf for years. Translated from the French by Gerard Hopkins. And I have to, I'm sorry, but the print is just too small. I can't tell you when it was published. <laughs> the titular protagonist walks free from court, acquitted of attempting to poison her husband. What more do you need to know? It was published sometime be before 1970, because that's when the author died. Several years ago, maybe this first year of my that I was on Booktube, I read a no novel or novella by the Brazilian novelist Graciliano Ramos, called Barren Lives, which I enjoyed. I didn't love. It was a tough story about really poor people, but I was really glad that I read it. And for that reason, I picked this up a year or two ago from NYRB when it was brought out. Sal Bernardo by Graciliano Ramos, translated from the Portuguese by Padna Viswanathan. I quite like that cover. The protagonist uh, used to be a field hand, and he has kicked and clawed and schemed his way to prosperity. Ramos died in 1953. I am a big fan of the gay French writer Edouard Louis. The first one that I read was The End of Eddie. So no, I've been reading him basically in chronological order ever since his debut. I don't know about whether the translation publication order is different than the, the French, but I read The End of Eddie, loved it. Then I read History of Violence, loved it. It was a really tough read, but an incredible work of autofiction. And I don't remember who the translators are for them. This one that I've got in my hands here is Who Killed My Father? And the translator is Lauren Stein. First published in 2019 in English translation, I believe. First publication in French, 2018. And this is... I believe, a straightforward memoir about his father, with whom he had a very difficult relationship. And there's, I don't know if it's a companion volume, but the next book that I have on my shelf to read is the book he's written about his mother, but I thought I'd start with this one. Here is a collection of gay short stories from Brazil. So I'll have to, yeah, no, I think it's okay. They're, these are very gay short stories, and I think the other book is not gay at all, so it should be all right. But I still have, I have four months to stretch these out, so I can read them in different months. It's called Moldy Strawberries. Stories by Cal Fernando Abru. Translated from the Portuguese by Bruna Dantas Lobato. Sarah of Hardcover Hearts was on my Bite Size Book Chats about mm, six months ago, maybe, and uh, raving about this novel that I barely knew a thing about. Set in 1913 and was published... Oh, 1980. I can hardly read that, but I think it's 1980. Isabel Colgate's The Shooting Party. I'll put a link to that chat because she totally sold me on it. I promptly bought it, and this would be a good time to finally get to it. At the time that we did our bite-sized book chats, 
Isabel Colgate was still alive and she was about 100. Or certainly in her 90s. I hope she's still alive and writing books. Editing Sean here with the sad news that Isabel Colgate shuffled off this mortal coil in March of 2023. She was 91. I've got a lot of bite-sized book chat books here. Here is another one, Voting Day by Claire O'D. And this is written by, I believe, an Irish or certainly a British writer. But it's a Swiss story. And I did a, had a bite-sized book chat with Mikiko about it. And it's uh, historical fiction. It's on the day, I think in the 1950s, or maybe the 1960s, when there was a referendum in Switzerland about should women get the vote. And they lost! And it's about the lives of three, I believe, three different Swiss women on the day of the referendum. It sounded just incredible. And this is from Fairlight Moderns. So this is not translated. Here is a Sudanese novella I've had forever. It's time to get to it. Season of Migration to the North by Tayeb Salah. Translated from the Arabic by Dennis Johnson Davies. Uh, the narrator had been studying for years in Europe. It was back to his village along the Nile in the Sudan. It's the 1960s. That's all I need to know. The last one I have to tell you about today is one that Mark Nash sold me on. And the overlap between Mark's taste in reading and mine is pretty small. But this one sounded a little bit out of my comfort zone. But something that I really wanted to try. Siphonophore by Jamie Batchen. And it's... It's like historical fantasy, like, but I don't think fantasy is the right word. I hope it's not the right word because bleh, but it's like, it's not real history. The protagonist is marooned in the Gulf of Darien, following independent Scotland's doomed colonization attempt at the end of the 17th century. Scotland did try to colonize another country at the end of the 17th century. That was news to me. I'm not sure what else in that sentence I just read to you is fiction or history, but... Um, it's kind of slipstreamy or not all true, like maybe not, not sci-fi, I hope. Well, I'm getting uncomfortable, but I, I'm, I have to try it. So, <laughs> And this is one I'm definitely going to try this year because I've been holding it up for several readathons in a row here. That's what I got. Thanks for watching.